Good evening and welcome. I hope that you had a great day, a great afternoon. I'm glad that you're, you're here. We're going to jump into Romans, the 13th chapter. Paul, in chapter 12, he, he sort of refocused. He, uh, he began teaching us how to live among one another, how to live with uh, a diverse people group. He's really working with a broad spectrum of, of people. Here in the church in Rome, and, and you know, and, and I know as well, that even people of the same culture with diverse personality, sometimes it's a challenge to bring together in, under one roof and have them get along. And so what Paul is doing is he's, well, he's tying our behavior to the, the gifts that we have in Christ. We've been blessed so greatly by Christ, it is our just due to behave. As such, and so Paul is given all sorts of uh, behavioral modifications, new ways of, of thinking about how we interact with one another and with uh, people, such as verse 18 here in chapter 12, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And then, you know, pushing it even further in verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. It's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So he's, he's, he's readjusting the paradigm we live in. We're not, we're not going to repay an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. A hurt feeling for a hurt feeling. Uh, that's not that's not the way Christians are going to live. It's not the way we're going to behave amongst one another and amongst the world. And here in chapter 13, Paul turns his attention to government of all things. Now he's got to try to work on us there as if what he said wasn't already challenging enough. He's going to tell us how to live within whatever government we find ourselves subjected to. So here in verses 1 and 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God, excuse me, what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Ouch. Anybody anybody have a problem with that? Are we all good? At least we got one honest guy in here, right? Elliot raised his hand. That's not, it's challenging, right? Because we don't agree with our government all the time. Just like we don't agree with any particular individual all the time, we struggle uh, at times to, to get along. We, we live in a particular situation. It's far from what was being experienced in Rome. I think about Paul in first century Rome's context. We have... During the writing of this particular letter, Nero would have been emperor. He hasn't went full-scale uh, crazy yet. Maybe that's not the politically correct way of saying that. He has not, he has not began persecuting Christians to satisfy his own building projects and such just yet. Um, he's still being counseled by some pretty wise uh, people. Seneca, very famous, written a lot of uh, a literature. In fact, I've had to read some of his writings, it's, and he's really good. Very, very smart guy. Nero had some very intelligent, very moral people surrounding him, and then he had them killed and surrounded himself with other guys who were not so much. So here in Rome, uh, they live under an authoritarian rule. Uh, if you try to buck Rome, if you were to resist, if you were to try to raise up any sort of, and I don't want even call it rebellion, some sort of micro-resistance, you would likely be put to death, and it would likely be uh, either on a cross or through beheading, which was the most expedient. Cross was more of a ceremonial thing. So not resisting in, in, the, first, in the church of, of Rome here is, is well, it's, it's tantamount to life really, to survival. We live in a context, we live in a republic. We elect people like us, well, supposedly like us, to 
uh, carry our values and, and vote on our behalf on particular issues, amendments, and whatever. You understand how that works. And, uh, and if it's working right, the will of the people is carried out in government, right? That's, that's how it works. And we have a certain amount of freedom to uh, protest. We have freedom to write letters to our representatives, to express our thoughts to them. We have a lot of avenues afforded to us that obviously the church in Rome d d did not have. And, and so there's, there's some difference, right? There's some difference in the way we can interact with our government versus the way church and Christians could interact with uh, Rome. However, that being said, we still have an idea that Paul is, is putting out here for us. That we're to be subject. Now, here it now, any of you guys newsies, I mean, you, you got Fox News turned on and you get up in the morning and it pretty much runs there the rest of the day and you go to bed and it's still running when you turn it off. Kind of, I know some folks like that. I, I don't, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't, I'm not that guy. And I'll tell you why. It's, just, it's the second sentence in the first verse. There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And, and you can correct me after class if you'd like, but I, I understand my role as a citizen in the United States to be far less important than my role as a citizen in the kingdom of God. And I feel like if I execute that one well, then I have gone far and above my duties as a citizen in the United States. And what I mean is, is I'm going to vote, right? I'm, I'm going to participate in, in our republic democracy. I'm going to make the best decisions I can. I'm going to exercise the freedoms that I have, just like Paul is urging the church here at Rome to do. You've got a certain amount of, of leeway here. And I'm going to do those things. And at the end of the day... I'm going to sleep soundly, not giving a second thought to what's taking place in the Oval Office or on the Senate floor or in the House because I know that those that exist have been instituted by God. At the end of the day, God is in control. And, and when I see friends that watch the news constantly and are constantly worked up and I get a phone call because of some resolution that's been passed, it takes me a minute to, 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 to get ratcheted up to the intensity because you kind of got it when you're carrying that conversation on, you got to match intensity with intensity, right? And so I can only say, I don't care, you know, so, so strongly. I can rest easy because I do have faith that regardless of our leadership, God's will is being done. And we, it may not be done the way I want it done. I mean, I wish every person in the United States was a faithful Christian and every appointed official was uh, a Christian and that everybody's values were exactly mine and that they exactly line up with Scripture like I wish mine did. And this country would be just ran like that. Well, it doesn't happen that way, does it? We, 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 we don't live in that place just yet. So let me give you an example. Um, Israel, under covenant with God, part of the covenant, and it's a huge part, and I don't want to undersell it here, the covenant with Abraham afforded them a land. We call it the promised land. They've got Palestine. They got, you know, almost from Egypt all the way around up the Levant, around the Dead Sea, from the Mediterranean, the Great Sea, over past the Dead Sea, all the way up north of Mesopotamia and around. And they had all this land that is, is given by God as their promised inheritance so long as they remain faithful. All right, so we go through 430 years in Egypt. God brings them out. They wander around the wilderness for far too long because of their own unbelief. God gets them into the promised land. He clears out cities for them, in front of them. He does give them cities they did not build. He does give them the vineyards that they did not plant. So he's, God's keeping his promises even to people that struggle to maintain faithfulness. And we see 
after a period of time, we've been in 1 Samuel, that the people required a king. They wanted an earthly king. They didn't want God to be their king. They want an earthly king like the rest of the people around them. God does as such, and you get Saul, who this coming uh, Wednesday night, we'll, we'll wrap up his reign. Then we're going to get David, and then with Solomon, we're going to see the empire already in that early stage in its infancy start to crumble with idolatry. And then with his son Rehoboam, the kingdom is going to split in two, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And then generations of kings are going to follow in both Judah and Israel, the northern kingdom. And God is going to have all he can stand. He's patient. He is loving. He's kind and gracious. And after century after century after century of unfaithfulness and idol worship, God exercises his right to end covenant. And he does. He removes the people from the land of promise and he uses Babylon to do it. He raised up a king. Y'all remember his name? Nebuchadnezzar. And when we first start reading about Nebuchadnezzar and his approach to Israel, he is a bad guy. He is evil. It's terrible. And we jump into Daniel in the first couple of chapters and Daniel and his three friends are in captivity and we're thinking, this, this Nebuchadnezzar, he's a bad guy. He's terrible. And then a couple more chapters and we find that God is communicating to Nebuchadnezzar. And then we find later that Nebuchadnezzar is beginning to have faith in, the, in this God of Daniel and, and Nebuchadnezzar himself then becomes unfaithful and God turns him to a creature or some sort of wild beast. He's out in the fields grazing like a cow and then he comes to his senses. He repents. God reinstates him as king of Babylon again. This is not Israel. God has raised up a ruler in an evil nation, an evil king to do the business of God. So it's very easy for me to see this passage here in Romans and recognize that God is in charge regardless of who sits on the throne. So again, I'll just restate it simply. I find chapter 13, verse 1 to be very comforting. Regardless of what the political landscape here is in, is in the United States, and regardless of the trajectory that we as Christians perceive this nation to be traveling on, I still see a God that's in control. Amen? Somebody. Thank you. All right. So verse 2, we got a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a, just to make sure you heard me correctly in the first verse from Paul, therefore whoever resists the authorities, resist what God has appointed. Or in other other words, if you find yourself rebelling against the leadership that God has in place, you're, you're going to find yourself opposing God. There's a certain amount of fear in that for me, right? If God has intentions for a nation, has raised up even a evil king such as Nebuchadnezzar to do some work for him, what happens when I find myself resisting what God has set into motion? Scary. Pretty scary. And so Paul follows this up in the second part of verse 2. Those who resist will incur judgment. Judgment with Paul equals punishment. Punishment. So, yeah, um, I, I find these verses actually very reassuring. I, I really do. Uh, it, it, it provides a, a new and a, a, a good perspective for being a citizen of the kingdom of God and a citizen of whatever nation you happen to live in. I, I've developed some friendships there at Harding with some guys that uh, were raised, born, lived in China. And they had to, to sneak around to have church, to study, study the Bible as we have it. Uh, in China, they have what they call the... Uh, well, it's the church is ran by the government. There is a nice name for the three house government. I can't think of the three house church. I can't remember what they call it. It's got a unique name and might not even shouldn't should have mentioned it. But right now, uh, a world away from us, there are Christians who are uh, sneaking around worshiping God in houses as best they can to avoid persecution from a government who doesn't allow it. They want to control the religion of the state. So 
uh, I, I, uh, we see a people who is not resisting per se as much trying to live and thrive as a Christian. And that is one thing that Paul does stress is that uh, we maintain our kingdom citizenship ahead of our national citizenship. We see that in other places. Uh, uh, but for here in Romans, Paul is making sure that they understand their role as kingdom citizens here as national citizens of Rome. All right. I spent way too much time on that uh, this morning over Paratown. I only actually covered those two verses, so I'm actually cutting pretty short. I want to share a few more verses. This is from Paul, his pastoral letter to Titus. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Just uh, another nod to... Uh, falling in line and being a uh, or flying under the radar Christian within your nation. Peter, similar advice. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Yeah, all right. Uh, be subject to. And the reminder that Paul is adjusting the paradigm in which we live as Christians. Uh, the church at Rome, as individuals, they're having to reevaluate. They get along with one another and the way they get along with government, such as here in verse 17 of chapter 12, repaying no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, not just one another, not just with those in the church, but everybody in the community. Right? That's how, that's how Christianity spreads. All right. To press on here. Uh, back to verses 1 and 2 and then to 3. And, here we go. 3 and 5. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. All right, there's a pretty big chunk there. First, first phrase up there, for the rulers are not a terror to good conduct. Just think about the passage we just looked at from Romans 12, 17 to 21. Not avenging yourself. Uh, let me... Back up. I know Elizabeth is loving me backing up all these screens here. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. It's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. All right. If that is the new paradigm in which we're living, if we carry that out, there is no government on earth that's going to want to persecute you because you're going to be the best citizen they've got. If you treat people like that, they're going to love you. Look at that Christian right there. Christians are fantastic. Look at all that getting along they do. Right? And it's not just getting along for the sake of getting along. It's getting along so that we show people Christ. That's how Christianity spreads and grows, right? So rulers are not a terror to good conduct. We act like Paul has told us, or he's instructed us to act. We're not going to have a problem with those that rule over us. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you'll receive his approval. That makes sense. Um, the rebellion. Jewish rebellion in Rome. We're, we're just in here with this letter. We're a few years ahead of that. Same emperors, emperors in charge with Nero. But you're going to have what's known as the Jewish revolt happen. We have Jewish people, we're not, not Christians, just Jewish people that are tired of living under the rule of Rome. They believe the land is theirs, and, and rightfully so. Should they have remained faithful to God, it, it would be theirs. They begin going around and attacking. You've heard of the Sicarii. Right, they get embellished a lot in movies and things like that. Tom Tom Hanks movies, I think, have mentioned them some. I can't remember the name of those movies off the top of my head, though. Well, anyway, I'm not advertising for them anyway. Um, 
they would sneak around. They go to these parties. These, you know, the upper the upper government officials. You know, in in Jerusalem, they'd have these these big uh, gatherings, shindigs. Well, I can't try the banquets. Uh, uh, what I'm not sure what they would call them. And the Sakari, they would sneak in amongst them. They would be dressed as waiters or what have you, uh, uh, servers. And they'd walk through the crowd, and they, had, they were known for their knives, the Sakari knife, long, slender, uh, thin, thin blade is, a, is the tool of an assassin. And they would walk through the crowds. And they'd walk through these crowds, and they would assassinate various politicians as it were. And that sort of, that, that leads into the, the full-blown rebellion. It forces Rome to have to react, which is far more than Jerusalem. The Jews around Jerusalem could stand, right? Because as the armies of Rome march through the land of Israel, they bring devastation to every town and city they pass by. It seems to me as if we were to compare what Paul is teaching in chapter 12 versus uh, the Jewish people who had had all they could stand and wanted to rebel, assassinating folks probably doesn't fall into Paul's instruction, does it? That's not going to be considered very good citizenship by anyone's standards, right? Uh, it's amazing how far one could go in the name of God when actually they're just trying to fulfill their own their own wishes. There's probably a sermon in that somewhere. Verse 4, for, then this is just a continuation of the sentence, for he's God's servant for your good. Just an, it's just Paul again reminding people that authority has been appointed and anointed by God. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Uh, the sword here for Paul, especially in Rome, the sword was the expedient uh, tool for execution. It could happen very quickly and on the spot. It wasn't like trials, mistrials, appeals, and all that. It was you did it, you lose your head. And it was, it was a rather quick uh, process. And so when Paul is referring to the, the sword, not bearing the sword in vain, is that he's, they're ready to use it. You know, and this is based on your conduct. If you're wrong, be afraid because he has a sword and he's going to use it. It's going to happen. For he is a servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And so we're getting a very strong sense of God's control of, over government authority, right? Verse 5, therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So we have this twofold thing going on right here. One, uh, to receive the wrath of God would not be good because we refuse to be good citizens of the nation that we live in. And the other one is the wounding of the conscience. It is, uh, Paul states it, uh, states it elsewhere, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians, to the one who knows to do good, doesn't do it, to him it is sin. And that, that's what Paul describes as a wounding of the conscience. You can't know the right thing to do and then purposefully and intentionally do the wrong thing. And so it, we have kind of both at play. We have God's wrath coming in your own, your own condemnation, your self-condemnation. You, you've experienced, we all have, you did the wrong thing, you knew you were doing the wrong thing, and then you feel terrible about it. That's, uh, that's where we're at. That's as far as I made it this morning, but I really don't want to stop right there. Let's look at here because I got an example for this. John 19, again, we're at the trial of, of Jesus. He's there at uh, before Pilate. Pilate has been speaking to him, trying to get him to respond, right? Uh, chapter 19, starting verse 10. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. There are a lot of layers in that. I'm not going to unpack all of it, but what we have is Pilate being let off the hook 
slightly by Jesus. Your authority is yours because my Father has given it to you. It's been given to you from above. And so he does the therefore, right? He who delivered me over to you, the Sanhedrin, high priest, they have the greater sin. They're the ones that know better, supposed to know better. All right, pretty interesting. God-given authority even over the guy who persecuted his son. Okay, let's see. That gets us down to verse 5, 1 over 6, I think. I think maybe so. We still got time. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. I don't like taxes. Any you folks like taxes? Come on. Let me see your hand. Everybody loves a tax. Just go ahead. Man, I didn't think so. And we have this, this mandate, this example. And it sounds really familiar. Have you heard this somewhere else? Because it seems like this shows up somewhere else about paying taxes and doing it. And, and, and being righteous about it, right? Pharisees and scribes trying to catch Jesus, try to get him in a bind because they know if they're going to do any sort of legal action against Jesus, they need him to not just sin against God, but sin against Rome because they're going to need Rome's authority to do any kind of real damage to Jesus. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. They brought him a denarius. Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. All right. I guess we're paying taxes. Right? All right. I'm going to pay taxes. Let's, let's just step back and look at what Paul has is, is done. Chapter 12, he's modified our behavior. The way we're going to think, the, the things that we hold dear to us, such as getting at eye, of, eye for an eye, two for tooth, that pound of flesh, what have you. We're not going to do that anymore. We're, we're going to treat people better than they treat us, actually. And then we're going to have a certain respect for the government, uh, the, the government that rules over us. We're going to live peaceably. So far as I can, I'm going to live peaceably with everybody and bring honor. Okay, so I'm going to pay taxes. I'm going to obey. I'm, I'm going to be a good citizen of the nation, which should come easy. Right, especially if I've really taken to heart the teachings of chapter 12, being a good citizen in chapter 13 should, yeah, it should, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem, right? I can, we can roll right into, right in, right into that. All right, we're going to stop there, at verse, verse seven. Uh, we'll, we'll pick up in verse eight. Would anybody like a chance at rebuttal, or just want to go ahead and, and confess your tax sin? Any, any of that? Going on tonight. <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna stop it right there. Then uh, we're gonna offer the invitation. If you need the prayers of the church, we'd love to pray over you. Whatever you may be going through, to help you in however way and whatever way we can. Uh, to put Christ on baptism, this is an opportune time. We're here. The water's ready. And we'd love to assist you as we stand and we sing our song.